There we go. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're just past the top of the hour, and uh, I do have my screen shared. And just we we're having some technical issues, so everyone can see the screen just fine. Yes. Excellent. I like to hear that. I'll assume everyone else does. So. I can hear it as well. I, I can see it as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, again, good morning. We have a special guest with us, uh, and and we'll we'll get to, to Ben in just a moment. Uh, but, but first, and and again, as always, uh, first of all, welcome and and thanks for joining us. And I appreciate uh, the time that you're you're setting aside for this next hour. Uh, this is Hyperledger uh, Healthcare Special Interest Group. And as always, uh, as a reminder, we are uh, recording this, uh, this presentation. And I also am obligated to mention that we have an antitrust slide, so we'll move over to that. Uh, and so that antitrust policy, uh, if you will feel free to read through the details of it, there's a URL in there with additional information regarding antitrust for the Linux Foundation. But in sum, it, it really is just be a good person, and that's what that's really all about. Um, as always, uh, as well, if there's anyone on the call that's new uh, and you'd like to introduce yourself, now would be a great time to do so. Uh, I see a couple of new names or names that are unfamiliar to me, but uh, feel free to, to, uh, to say hello and uh, talk a little bit about yourself, your interests, where you're from, uh, and how blockchain technologies uh, you're seeing value in the healthcare space. Good morning, everyone. This is Alex Poston. Uh, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Hashed Health, based out of Nashville, Tennessee, although I happen to live in Orlando. <clears throat> it's a little nicer than Nashville this time of year. Uh, Hashed Health is a long-standing uh, healthcare blockchain uh, or distributed ledger organization. Uh, it's been focusing for years on trying to help people understand blockchain understand its space in, in the healthcare community and in the community as a whole. And um, my background specifically is starting healthcare technology companies uh, and you know hopefully solving some real world problems and then getting those out to people. So I appreciate being here and look forward to learning more. Well, great to have you, Alex. Uh, yeah, well, sure. Hash Health, I think most people know about Hash Health, uh, and great to have uh, uh, you on the call this morning. Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure this will be a, a great opportunity for you to learn for you to learn a little bit more about what's going on uh, with uh, with Ben and uh, and uh, Ledger Domain. And so, yeah, great to have you on the call. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else would like to introduce themselves? Okay, uh, sounds good. And if you are new, as a reminder, uh, we do have a membership directory and it'd be great to have you uh, put yourself on that list. And it's a great way to sort of connect with others within the community here. Uh, and uh, you're certainly not obligated to do so. Uh, but in order to get to the membership directory, you do need uh, to set yourself up with a Linux Foundation uh, ID. And that really gives you the opportunity to uh, make edits to the wiki here. Uh, as well, if you have any questions about the organization, uh, our special interest group specifically, uh, we have a, a, an FAQ page and that's what I'm showing you here. So if you have any questions, feel free to go there. And as well, um, if you have questions, contact uh, either myself uh, or Erica, my vice chair. Uh, and then, you know, as well, there are options for you to, to make use of uh, the Hyperledger community by either through Listserv, which is really email, uh, our wiki page is here, or uh, we also use Rocket Chat, which is sort of a, an open source Slack-like uh, community uh, for communicating with uh, membership in real time. So with that said, uh, let's move on to community announcements. And I really have only one announcement that I'd like to share with, uh, with the group, uh, which is uh, coming up in March of next year, uh, we have the, uh, the Hyperledger Global Forum. Uh, this is an annual event, and this year uh, it'll be in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and if you have any interest in participating in that, uh, feel free to jump over to the uh, uh, the forum, uh, the global forum page, uh, which I'm showing you here. Um, this is really kind of the the big event for uh, for the Hyperledger community uh, to to get a little bit more involved and learn more about what's going on uh, within Hyperledger. 
And uh, I believe, we're hoping we'll, we'll get uh, a, a number of speakers uh, from our community uh, in, the, in HC, the HC SIG community uh, speaking at that, uh, at that event. Uh, I know, I think we have three different, uh, at least three different uh, submitters that have uh, made uh, proposals for speaking. Um, and that, I think that ended just a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe this past week or two. Uh, if you do have an interest in uh, submitting a proposal, uh, let me know directly and I may be able to sort of help facilitate maybe getting something out of the wire. Uh, does anyone else in the community uh, on the call have uh, any announcements that they'd like to make? Nobody's doing anything? <laughs> uh, well, I see Wendy on the call. Good morning, Wendy. Uh, Good morning. Uh, do, do you have anything, any announcements that you, I, you've made a recent uh, change in, in career? Um, did you want to share that or do you want to keep that? Not going? yet. Okay. Oh, rats. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, uh, well, I'll, I'll sort of make a segue over uh, to Ben uh, because uh, Ben and I were just talking before the call uh, kicked off. Uh, ben was a speaker at the, uh, at the, the recent blockchain uh, conference in New York. Um, and I'll just sort of hand this over, slowly hand this over to Ben and introduce him. Uh, ben is our speaker for the hour. Uh, he's also CEO of Ledger Domain, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to have him uh, share with you some, some of the work that he and his team have been doing at Ledger Domain, uh, particularly as it relates to pharmaceutical supply chain, but there, he's got uh, several other projects that he's been up. As well, uh, just uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before Ben spoke at the uh, at the New York uh, uh, blockchain event, uh, and so I'll hand over to Ben. And, and as I do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you Ben the uh, I'll share with you uh, the uh, co-hosting opportunity, and so you should be able to take take command from here, and uh, and we'll get started. So good morning, Ben, and thank you. Good morning. Um, do I need to share still, or am I already sharing? Uh, yeah, you go ahead and share, and then everything will sort of switch over to you. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can get that done. Um, and as Ben is getting spun up, uh, for those uh, those of us that would like to to to, uh, to take home a copy of that uh, of, of his presentation, you'll see the URL. There's a link in the wiki page uh, for his PDF that's available to him. There we go. All right, let me see if I can now run the slideshow. Yep, you're, you got it. Perfect. Well, thanks very much, Rich. Let me start off everybody uh, at Rich's request with what was going on at the summit. And uh, what I would say is that there was a great attendance at the healthcare summit in New York, broad group of people. Um, in terms of our community, I think the two things that were expressed were that Hyperledger uh, was particularly in the lead at this point in healthcare, which interested me from a perspective. The perception that people had and offered was that uh, permission was winning. And the biggest concern was performance levels, which uh, actually surprised us quite a bit. Uh, our own view at Ledger Domain is that Hyperledger Fabric is performing beautifully in terms of scalability. What we shared with people was we felt we were 36 months ahead of our uh, clients' needs, um, but a number of people still seem to be struggling with that, and that was even practitioners. So that may be something for us to talk about at a later point. But what I'd like to do today is to dive in and talk about some of the things that we're working on. And I know we've got a mix of people in terms of their mentality and interest, but what I'd like you to do is to jump in and ask questions at any time. But if you have a technical question, I think I'd like for you to wait till we get to the technical architecture slide, and then we can do a little bit of a deeper dive for the people who have a technical question. If you have a question regarding Healthcare, more general, just jump right in and uh, fire away. So why Hyperledger for us? We've actually been a member of Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation for the past three years. Uh, we chose Hyperledger 
fabric as our primary focus in the fall of 2016, which is kind of amazing looking back. At that time, it was not what it is today. Um, but we felt that on an enterprise scale basis, it was going in a good direction. And in particular, at that point, we felt that our clients and prospects were less likely to buy into a Bitcoin or altcoin based model. Um, we felt that it would be uncertain as to whether or not that that would be even be legal in certain jurisdictions. And many of our clients have a global footprint. Um, so those were some of the reasons that we focused um, on Hyperledger Fabric. And we've been very, very satisfied. In general, we run all of our implementations on Hyperledger Fabric. And we start most of our implementations with an iPhone client as well. And that way we have a very clean, simple stack to do all of our prototyping and demonstration projects on, and it works very well for us. In terms of blockchain's potential for privacy and compliance, that's very much a hot button with all of our clients. We're about two thirds healthcare at this point, but whether you're in healthcare or not, Privacy is the number one issue in people's minds for new systems. If you're operating in Europe, it's GDPR. If you're operating in US healthcare, it's HIPAA. And the new one that's coming up January 1st is Cal Privacy. And our belief is that we're going to be serving clients and prospects that want to skate to where the puck is going and understand the need for privacy and compliance. There's always going to be bad actors and there's always going to be companies that decide that they'd rather just, you know, do the crime and do the time and pay the fine. Um, but for us, if you're investing for the long run with blockchain, you're going to want to come up with a compliance solution. The way that we do that at Ledger Domain is we've built a DocuSeal framework on top of Hyperledger Fabric. And what it does essentially is build out a layer on top of Hyperledger that enables us to make use of Hyperledger's off-chain storage or private collections or whatever you're calling it these days. And it enables us to put all of the PII in the private collection. And in particular, the way that we've set it up is as a self-service model. And I think that's very, very important. And what do we mean by that? If Rich is a customer of a big healthcare plan and they need to get his driver's license or other personal information, he can put it in private storage on the blockchain. It's hashed, the hash is placed uh, on the blockchain itself, but he's got total control over his driver's license image. He can take it down, he can put it back up, he can share it with his provider, he can unshare it, but if they needed to double check it and transact it, they can always message him and get that information back. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about how we do this. This is a relatively recent architecture. Um, and I wanna say, just to be clear, that some of our clients are still on, um, Fabric 1.2, um, you know, different folks move and migrate at different points and they're able to do that since they have their own blockchain. But the, can we see, can you guys see my arrow? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So the, what we've done, if you look at everything there in teal and orange, that would be standard fabric modules. So we use 14 of the 17 Hyperledger hyper modules by our count. And what we've redone is we've rewritten everything in Go that most people use the Node.js versions of. So our implementations are 100% Go, and we've built a toolkit that manages governance with a root of trust, has secure comms so that you can set every, all your orgs up securely, um, and remotely, and as you, we also set it up so that you can set up your own off-chain collections on your org 
locally or on the cloud under your control. The way this governance works is that if um, Ledger Domain is serving as the sysadmin, and let's say Rich is running his own org and he's the org admin, all the keys get moved back and forth and all the contracts get set up through the governance module by common consent of all the org admins and the sysadmin. The sysadmin is not able to see any of the smart contracts that orgs set up in private channels amongst themselves, and nor is the sysadmin able to open up the private collections. So the org admin has total control over their org, and they run their MSP down to the member level. Does that make sense to everybody? And yeah. then we run off-world credentials for people that want to do it that way. And essentially, the idea would be that if Rich had a big organization, you know, he was working for Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or somebody like that, and they wanted to set up a link to Active Directory or one of their standard um, models for managing their membership, they could do that. Meanwhile, if I were running for Ledger Domain, uh, a catch-all org for smaller players, we could set them up with credentials directly through the uh, Fabric MSP. Does that make sense to everybody? So in terms of stacking it up then, we run our own app server that sets up the community, arrays the orgs on the hybrid cloud, and that all gets handled by the sysadmin, and then we interact with the orgs to get them set up on each of their instances, and they then have their off-chain and their local node all managed together. Any questions on the part of everybody? So again, this is relatively high, standard Hyperledger fabric. We're using almost all the basic modules, and we've just made adjustments to drive more performance, more scalability, and enabled our people to communicate uh, securely without having to go outside of the Fabric instance. And today, people are passing keys across the table or using Dropbox or other insecure models. This way, the keys get exchanged the right way inside a secure channel that we've set up on the side. And again, we're super big fans of starting off on something like an iPhone. That's great for supply chain applications where you're gonna scan a barcode, a 2D barcode in particular. And it's great for sharing XML messages. Um, and it's a terrific way to put a biometric front end uh, onto your wallet and to provide a simple look and feel for people who don't want to have that command line interface vibe that so many of the blockchain um, solutions offer. So again, most of our clients, they have a sophisticated person that is part of the company. You know, so Pfizer has somebody who's very apt to Hyperledger Fabric, but they have 100,000 employees that don't want to get their hands dirty. Um, and we provide them with a simple iPhone interface to do their business. Our goal, and this is true almost across all of healthcare clients, is that nobody really needs to know that there's a blockchain backend. We're offering something that has value to people that they can see and touch and feel, but it doesn't have to be a blockchain experience in their own minds. There's feeling the security without really getting too far into the weeds. And so the way that that runs is we put a specific app on DocuSeal. You'll see some examples of that in a minute. Then DocuSeal manages and the notifications and the communications with the blockchain and also picks up the private collections the same way. So this is really what you're used to looking at, I think, um, if you're a Fabric developer. But we've just put some of these tools in so that what we've got is a Python interface for all of these things instead of all the heavy lifting that you're used to doing. The other thing on an outboard basis is we've, we've structured all the notification engines separately. So we do use, you can see here, the Fabric Event Services or what they used to call Event Hub. 
but we've put outboard in addition some other event services that, so that we can manage notifications to the iOS environment. Hey, hey, Ben, this is Rich. I have, I have a couple of questions for you real quick. Fire away. Um, how, how sensitive uh, to Fabric version uh, is your solution? Which is to say, if, you, if Fabric uh, did a version rev or uh, you had a customer that was you know, uh, predicated on an earlier version of Fabric, wh where does that sensitivity lie for this overlay? So that's a great question. Um, I think many of the people on the call are familiar with the idea of validated systems. Uh, and in the healthcare space, um, many people would want to have some level of validation of their system. And so the idea of continuous integration and all this sort of stuff is probably tougher in that environment. So to your point, we would want to have a highly scheduled documented approach to updating any of these things and so our typical client or or prospect would be you know they would only be on iphone 8 today they might only be on an earlier version of the ios system um, they migrate in the healthcare world often six to twelve months behind they want to see the bugs surface and get fixed before they move and I think that we would see the same thing in general on our side. As I mentioned early on, many of our implementations were on 1.2. They're still on 1.2. We don't migrate them automatically. And we'll schedule, say, a move to 1.4 and let people know what the plan is, handle the documentation, and do it from there. So there's a whole process of communication, documentation, and validation where necessary on that side. We have not yet, Rich, decided when and if we would move to uh, Fabric 2.0. I'm sure there are people who know more about that than I do. 1.4 is sort of the secure release that I think will be supported for the next couple of years. And we haven't yet determined our game plan for moving to a 2.0 model. I'd be interested in hearing what other people are saying there but that's kind of where we see people sitting. Does that answer your question? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and one of the, the reasons for bringing this uh, question up is governance uh, is becoming an increasingly uh, sort of concerning issue. And I think this is a great example of that where you have a solution, it's a successful solution, uh, and, and you know, a customer would have to start under, trying to understand uh, how do they See, uh, see their solution over time as uh, as the back end uh, revisions dr get driven, and you know, and you, and they're wondering, well, how do we how do we sort of grow into these uh, newer releases? And so, um, yeah, and, and so we are definitely starting to see some some questions of governance coming up, and it's it's good to hear that uh, that this solution has some of that sort of that understanding uh, already sort of baked into it. Yeah, it does. And I think, but there, are, the other thing that it bakes in, which is uh, surprising to a lot of new people, um, is that if you look at this, everybody can see the slide here? Yes. So let's say we had 43,000 people on our clinical supply chain. Um, system, only the sysadmin and the org admins would actually be able to see the smart contracts. So that might be 17 people out of 43,000. And so that old Bitcoin model of everybody looking at everything um, is not something that we have had our um, governors, if you will, endorse. Um, you know, for the most part, in pharma and healthcare, uh, the perception is that there should be a high level of transparency amongst the governors and the admins. Um, but there's no way inside of this DocuSeal app for someone to can open it and get a look at the smart contracts. And in the case of some of our 
implementations, there's not even a directory, which again, it's, I'm hoping over time we're gonna see more transparency, but the basic idea is that if you work at a big drug company and you're sending um, information to a site, you have that person in your own local directory, but there's no sort of huge master directory of all 43,000 participants anywhere that you can access. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So not only is it permissioned, you have to know who you want to reach out to. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the healthcare things that we've talked about and worked on, we've all seen. You know, we're big believers that patient registries are going to be more important. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, Ben, Kamlesh here. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Actually, I have one what? question regarding the um, fabric. Uh, so, you are using Zoo Kafka as a consensus mechanism here? Yeah? Yes. Okay, yeah, so we how many standard, Kafka we and Zoom per? We have the standard order, standard setup, and we're running typically here. Most commonly these days, we're running on top of um, EC2 on AWS on level DB. Yeah, yeah. same thing. Same thing, generally the same architecture. So are you talking about the hybrid clouds? The nodes are running on the hybrid cloud or just the on one particular uh, instance of the any cloud or like one peer running on the IBM cloud, one peer on the AWS cloud, other cloud on the some local machine like this architecture? So what I would say is that um, some of our clients are using a local server. All we need is an Ubuntu instance. And so they might use a local server. Um, it would be also common for people to be on AWS on what I would call an adjacent model where I'm on AWS, Pfizer's on AWS, you know, but they're running it on their own account with their own org. You know, I presume that we're both somewhere in Seattle in the basement somewhere, but you know, it's under our own control. Um, the one thing about the hybrid cloud model that I would highlight is that Fabric itself uh, right now is a little tricky to use on your own server on the private collection side. It's easy to run a node, uh, but you do have to do a little bit more database management for the private collection. If you're running on AWS and it's not too heavy, you can put it all on the same level DB. Um, okay. But when you run off chain, you've got a, you've got a, uh, and your, and your off cloud and running it locally, you've got to pick a database and, and do some real work there. Um, to answer your other question, you know, on mixing uh, IBM, Oracle, and um, others, again, I would say there is a database issue um, that you've got to be aware of. So in our case, we typically tr try to keep everybody on level DB and we try to keep everybody uh, on a standard database off chain. It's much easier if you can keep everybody there. Um, and when you start blending the different blockchain as a service people, you, you can run into some uh, uh, hinky issues at this point. Yeah, got it. Got it. And I have another question. So you are using uh, Docker, Dockerize like an underlying technology or uh, running the PR or order as the net, native uh, code on the Ubuntu machine or using the Docker? So in terms of containers, which is your question, um, yeah, yeah. In terms of containers, uh, we view all of these things as an implementation detail. So as we go through it with our clients, um, each group has a different view of these things. Um, I think that Docker makes life a little bit easier. We do worry, and I wouldn't, I would never write this down, but I'm just telling you what we worry about. We do worry about security on Docker. We do worry about security on CouchDB. Um, and yeah. so if you've got, the more of these uh, layers that you add, 
uh, and the more flexibility that you add, the more challenging it is to prove and validate your security envelope. And so we, in certain instances, we've run purely on bare metal for clients who are highly sensitive to these issues. When you run bare metal and level DB, I think you've got a very tight security envelope. If you were to run couch DB on Docker, you know, you've probably got a lot more flexibility in terms of doing searches and things like that. But at the same time, you, you, we start worrying more and more about a backdoor problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, but actually I'm asking about the uh, order and peer, like about the component of the fabric, like uh, order and peer running in the Docker containers. So that's what I'm saying. In fact, we actually, we'll actually run the peers on bare metal in certain instances. That's what I'm saying. But to your point, yes, it's easier to manage with a Kubernetes and Docker model. And um, we manage all of that through this fabric DevOps tools. So we spin them up that way and it's all a one button kind of process. Okay, okay, yeah. But again, these are all important implementation details and every, um, every one of our communities has a slightly different sensitivity. Mm, yeah. And it's sometimes, again, I don't mind saying this, sometimes it's their own experiences in completely unrelated implementations inform them as to what they're scared of. They're fighting the last war maybe. Um, but if they've had good experiences with Docker and good experiences with AWS, you know, they're more likely to want to work with that. We have big clients that have that feeling. Um, and if they have had, you know, less good experiences, they have a different view. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank right, you. Any more sort of technical deep dive questions? No, uh, it's clear now. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly. Patient registry, you think is a big area to provide the info hubs with blockchain. Obviously that's a great way, but to manage uh, PII, and particularly as people want to aggregate clinical studies, those sorts of things, it's going to be a very exciting area, but it's very, very challenging. Um, obviously, you've got to have an identifier scheme. You've got to think about how you want to link to your caregivers, your doctors. How do they get access? And then how do you structure it? This is one of the fascinating things that we talked about at the Blockchain Summit in New York. Um, you know, there's all these people in Silicon Valley who are talking about people owning their healthcare data. But if you're a, man a steward of medical records, the last thing you would want is for a patient to come in and erase an embarrassing STD or something else that, that embarrassed them that they didn't want people to know. So ownership only goes so far. Um, and stewardship only goes so far and data fiduciary goes so far. So it's a balancing act of maintaining compliance with HIPAA and with newer policies like Cal Privacy. But obviously in diseases, in rarer diseases where you wanna get a broad catchment area, you know, Chinese patients, European patients to try to find, you know, a genetic uh, problem or something like that. And maybe there's only 30,000 people worldwide. It's really critical to be able to put all this together. Talk a little bit about one of our bigger projects that's in the open, Clinical Supply, KitChain. You can look at kitchain.org. We worked with a lot of very terrific, well-informed, large companies on this, like Pfizer, IQVIA, who is the old Quintiles, UPS, the delivery company, Merck, UCLA Health, GSK, Thermo Fisher, and Biogen were our partners. You can see what they're fighting with here is that active clinical studies where they're trying to find new drugs have doubled over the last 10 years. And the pharmacies that manage those are bursting at the seams. And again, for those of you that are starting to scratch your head on what clinical supply is, commonly, if you're going to test two drugs and find out which one is the better, you have to anonymize them and you have to blind people. So you basically would take a blue pill, and a yellow pill and you would put them both into a white gel cap 
and you'd label one A and you'd label one B and you'd mail them out and you'd give one patient the A and one patient the B and find out who had the best effect with the least side effects. Obviously, that's a very tricky process and it's a perfect process for blockchain. It's also perfect for blockchain because there are over 800 companies um, sponsoring studies at 20,000 different centers. And so UCLA, for instance, who's one of our partners, has 700 clinical studies with 100 different sponsors. They don't have time to go to the Pfizer website and the Merck website and the GSK website to figure all this stuff out. And so the thought was that we could put together a blockchain that would show UCLA all the UCLA information and show Merck all the Merck information. So we worked together as a group over the last two years. We were the solution provider. And the goal was to basically provide an Amazon-like experience to everyone in the clinical supply chain. And you can see here that you're manufacturing. You have companies managing the clinical trials called CROs. You have people that are making this stuff called CMOs. You've got couriers like UPS and FedEx. You've got the sites like UCLA and the patients. All these are the people. You've got to get them through customs. They have cold chain. It's amazing how many different types of organizations want to touch this stuff. And the idea is to deliver an auditable and transparent system, give people real-time information and advanced notification of things happening. So here are the roles that we modeled. The sponsor would be someone like Pfizer or Merck. The distributor would be their CMO, somebody who's managing this blinding into the white gel caps. And then the courier ships stuff out to UCLA, and then it ends up at the end site. So UCLA itself has a pharmacy. You would, I would call it a pharmacy, but if you saw it in person, it looks like a Costco. It's that big. It's a huge warehouse, and it serves 500 pharmacists and 200 individual pharmacies inside of the UCLA community. They have over 200 local clinics in addition to the seven hospitals. And then the clinical study is managed by a principal investigator at UCLA and then many, many patients. So let's take a minute to look at that. Hi, Victor from Ledger Domain here. Over the next two minutes, I'm going to walk you through the KitChain app, which supports a robust collaborative model for pharmaceutical clinical supply chains. By using the power of blockchain, KitChain unlocks secure, private, and immutable inventory and event tracking for clinical supply shipments, replacing paperwork and manual transcription. Today, we're going to hitchhike a ride with a typical new user, Alex, a new employee for a leading clinical services vendor. Logging in for the first time, Alex will kick off a shipment notification and store accompanying documentation. As the documentation is uploaded to his personal lockbox on an encrypted server, a unique hash is generated and sealed into the blockchain. So it's impossible for the document to be secretly altered or falsified. All of this is handled by Ledger Domain's Selvage server. Reopening the message, it's verified by the blockchain. Now let's share it with someone else. Alex is going to share the file with Jen Cologne, who works at a clinical site. So Jen can view and also learn more about the message to confirm its origins and authenticity. Going back to his messages, Alex can get more info on each one, including who he's shared it with. Alex can also unshare or delete a document. Now let's take a look at some messages that have been shared with Alex. As Alex opens a message, its authenticity is also verified against the blockchain. By harnessing the power of blockchain, KitChain lets Alex upload, share, and control access to messages with confidence, all in a way that's secure and unforgeable. In real-world applications, KitChain will be configured with messages designed to fit the needs of the pharmaceutical supply chain, including the ability to read and share unique identifiers. With the advent of personalized medicine, the clinical supply chain of the future will not only have to contend with greater complexity, it will have to be managed with HIPAA and personal healthcare information regulations built in from the ground up. Great, so let's move on to supply chain systems and wrap things up. 
the other things that we work on are in the supply chain space. So KitChain would be supply chain, but you saw in its current form, it's more messaging oriented. They tend to know where the packages are, but knowing what's in them and knowing what you can know, some people would be blinded, others not, is what's key. And capturing those messages in GS1 formats is what's critical. In a supply chain world, things are a little bit different if you're managing the actual custody as well. You've got to capture all the transaction. You've got to be able to develop trends and analytics on the control plane. And then you've got to surface you know, your risk management issues, which is basically flagging, categorizing bad transactions and figuring out what you're going to do with them. The blockchain is great at figuring out what was supposed to happen, but when you have something that wasn't supposed to happen, you've got to be ready for that as well. And so what we've been working on is the next generation pharma supply chain. Um, there's something called the DSCSA, which is a new law relatively passed in 2012 that's being basically supervised by the US Food and Drug Administration. And it's basically that you really need to know that you're not getting counterfeit or suspect drug as a patient. And the dispenser can really tell you where that drug came from. That's what's called tracing. Many of us have been talking about track and trace. I would say that tracking is looking down the supply chain. Tracing is looking back up the supply chain. So they, earlier this year, the FDA asked for people to come up with pilots. And so we partnered with our friends at UCLA to build and test a last mile blockchain-based system um, called Bruin Chain. Um, and the, we picked a drug called Spinraza that is basically saving babies' lives, but is very, very expensive. And obviously, it's hard for UCLA to have a lot of doses around at $100,000 a dose. Here's the DSCSA timeline, which basically says, here we are where the alarm clock is. The wholesalers are already supposed to be shipping only serialized product that has serialized numbers. And the dispensers are up next to be receiving and shipping serialized product. And so obviously we're right on the cusp of having this thing go live so that by December of 2023, everybody will have unit level traceability all the way through on an interoperable system. So what we're doing on blockchain is to track and trace Spinraza. Here's the drug, as I mentioned, it's very expensive. It's a fabulous drug. And just to put it in perspective, this is a horrible statistic. When they did the clinical study for Spinraza, all of the Spinraza users survived and 30% of the children who were in the control group died during the course of the study. That's how horrible this disease is. And so they really want to make sure that they know exactly that they've got good Spinraza at the right place at the right time. So you're scanning the barcode, you get this long string of numbers, you chop it up, and then you have to provide it on a role-based basis to each of the players. And again, this is where Fabric shines. You've got role-based access, RBACs, you know about those, ABACs, whatever you want to call them. And you've got so many abilities inside to do this just the right way. So we've got these five roles, the admin role, the manager role, technician role, pharmacy role, and the prescriber role, with this prescriber being a doctor. And a technician being sort of someone on the loading dock who's not a registered pharmacist, but is a trusted person to unpack things and do the scanning. And so basically that's what we're working on at UCLA right now. It's called Bruin Chain. And the idea is to drive a terrific application, show it to the FDA. The FDA then will issue a final report next year. And then they'll have to figure out exactly where they're going to be going with this. But of the 16 people that are doing pilots, nine of them, and to my knowledge, all of them that are actually building systems are all on blockchain. And to our knowledge, about half of those people are on Hyperledger. So that's the end of our show. Um, any questions that people have?
Hello, Ben. This is Wendy. Um, great presentation, and I uh, certainly learned a lot. I had just wanted to get a feel for the degree to which this is truly in production. Yeah, so what I would say at this point is that we're really still mostly in pilot mode. Okay. And that very few people, I would really say, are in a true production mode. Yeah. When do you think you might be in production? I'm not sure that our customers are going to be wanting to talk about that. Oh, fair enough. So just curious. Yes, some of our, some of our uh, um, clients are a lot more forthcoming and by the nature of their consortium. So you can go on to LinkedIn and see the Clinical Supply Blockchain Working Group. You can't download the smart contracts, but you can find out a lot about what we're doing and you can join the group. Many of our other clients view this as highly competitive information. Oh, sure. We don't expect that they're going to be wanting to talk about whether they're in production. And as we mentioned early on, I, there are a subset of people in healthcare who view um, blockchain as something that's worth talking about with their clients and stakeholders but there's a lot of other people that view this as a competitive advantage and they don't plan on talking about blockchain ever i hope that answers your question um to the degree that you are able <laughs> Anyone else? Rich? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, maybe a follow on to Wendy's comment. I, how, how are your customers um, responding to the fact that at the end of the day, uh, this really is a blockchain solution? Do they care about it? Do they have an extra uh, sensitivity to it? Is there a sense of, um, uh, gosh, what's the right word for it? Um, uh, well, maybe extra sensitivity, uh, you know. Um, do, do you get a, are you getting a sense for that or, you know, cause one of the things that we deal with is at the end of the day, uh, it, a lot of what, what the solution set is on the back end, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and the customer is really looking for a solution uh, to get, you know, to do their work. So how, how much of that is exposed? How much of this is exposed to the customer that is in fact a blockchain solution? Uh, okay. So let's talk about that at, at two levels, but, I'm going to answer the question first in terms of our client or customer or prospect or buyer. Um, I think the oddest thing about this is that it has the, the feeling that we get with our customers, clients, buyers is very different from what you read in the newspapers. And at the core, I think the most concerning thing to them is that they're somehow not going to be able to absorb enough about the blockchain experience so that they could get somehow rooked or left behind from a technology standpoint. I think that's the weird thing about blockchain is it's perceived as being so strategic and so important that they really want to understand what's going on. And that... Oh, it Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And so yeah. it's, it's not so much that they don't trust it. It's that they, they want to make sure that they trust us as vendors and they want to trust Hyperledger Fabric as a platform. They're very concerned that there's somehow some amazing data that they have, what they're going to put on the blockchain is somehow going to get stolen from them or that there's some element of blockchain that's going to enable some new entrant to rook them in some way. And so as an example in the pharmaceutical supply chain, UCLA is not worried because they're still going to have their patients and Pfizer is not worried because the drug is still a Pfizer drug, but everybody in between is very much in agony about what this could do to their business. <laughs> Uh, that, that is understood. That much is understood. Absolutely. And the point that we make and the point that we continue to tell people is that we don't see blockchain supplanting and paving over systems of record at most of the companies that we're working with. 
So the way to think about it is, it's a little bit like if you've watched Wall Street uh, news shows and they have a ticker tape at the bottom. The ticker tape tells you the tr time and sale of all the stocks in the stock market. And that's basically a blockchain style application. It's a real time application to give you a small amount of information about what's going on in these systems. But it doesn't supplant the actual system of record at the brokerage firm to manage your stock market statement at the end of the month or anything else. It just ties everything up in together in an infomediary way, which is what I would call a data switch. And it enables people to look at a data feed coming out of the switch in real time that adds value to everybody. But that doesn't mean it's going to pave over everybody's application internally. There might be a few small systems that it supplants, but I don't think that's going to be the major driver here. Good. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's interesting. There's a seems to be a, maybe even still a little bit of cachet there that, that this is a blockchain solution. Uh, what, what we're sort of beginning to get, getting a sense for is, in fact, we, we tend to talk in terms of DLT uh, and less blockchain uh, just to maybe take away a little bit of the, uh, the hype that, that has sort of surrounded blockchain, uh, the, the term blockchain over the past year or two. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who like this DLT angle in our universe. I think what it creates is its own problem is this concern that everybody's going to have a copy of the ledger and they're going to be digging through it right. in their spare time. Right. Um, number one, that's not true. And number two, um, you know, it sets a, an expectation um, that is probably not realistic. Yeah. But yes, every one of these terms, you know, I think has, has, is a little bit of a loaded term, right? So you just have to be careful in terms of, of what it is you're promising. Exactly. Well, uh, w just to interrupt a little bit, uh, we are just coming up, uh, just have a few minutes left in the hour. Uh, maybe one last quick question and answer uh, before we close out. Okay. Um, well, again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ben. Uh, very much appreciate uh, the the uh, presentation. Uh, uh, as as I mean, this is to me very exciting in a lot of ways. In part because uh, what you what you're doing through Ledger Domain is very tangible, uh, and you're applying uh, blockchain technologies in a very uh, very broad way. And again, it isn't uh, you're not using blockchain for the sake of blockchain per se. It's actually getting real work done across multiple domains within the, the, the healthcare industry. And it's, it seems to be very tangible work that's getting done. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and if there's no other, uh, no other questions or comments, uh, uh, we, we are scheduled. Our next meeting uh, is in two weeks from today, uh, same time on this channel as well. Uh, and I believe we'll have an, another guest speaker. Um, uh, yeah, Mike. Mike Marchand, uh, he's uh, our HIE Integration Director over at UC Davis uh, Health, and he'll be talking about his uh, experiences in the in the blockchain space within the healthcare within healthcare, uh, and so that'll be two weeks from today. Well, thanks again, Ben. Uh, again, great presentation, uh, and your presentation will be available on uh, on the uh, uh, our website. Uh, as well, this recording will be av made available to the the whole of membership in the next day. Uh, so people will be able to, to, to watch this video uh, as, as they find time to do so. Um, any other thoughts, questions before we close out for the, for the week? Ben, thank you very, very much for your time there. Appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. Well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, have a great weekend. Ben, thank you so much. Uh, great, great presentation. Thank you very much, Rich. It was a real pleasure. All righty. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.